Tales of misconduct within the fandom are not uncommon. In recent years, we've had people outed as pedophiles, abusers, animal abusers, or a combination of any of those. Sometimes the stories we're given are blown out of proportion, turning out to be much more mild than we initially believed. Other times, they're tragically undersold, turning out to be far more severe than we'd have ever guessed when we first heard. Today, I'm going to talk about a little situation that many of you in the fandom have likely heard of, that being the controversy surrounding Lucky Coyote and Don't Hug Cacti. Now, I will preface this by stating that this is an ongoing story. A lot of things are still really up in the air. Due to this, I have linked several resources in the description to catch you up on this situation, such as the Google Doc detailing Lucky's alleged extracurricular activities, as well as the interview Lucky had on Shiokami's channel. Now, I'm not here to deconstruct the Google Doc and read it out to you verbatim, as I personally feel doing that would be a disservice to those who built the document and interviewed the people who provided their testimonies. What I am here to do is discuss a handful of direct statements Lucky, or their partner, Scuff, gave in their interview with Shiokami. The reason why is because these are accounts given directly by Lucky in her own defense, yet when you observe them with a more skeptical eye, paint far more of a damning picture of her than I believe she realized at the time. We'll be discussing three particular points in this video, two from Lucky herself, and one from the mouth of Scuff. While I do find the point I'm making against Scuff to be worth noting, hence its inclusion, it would be disingenuous of me not to state up front that it's built upon my personal interpretation of his behavior in this video when a particular question is asked. With all that out of the way, we can begin. So, on February 26th, Lucky Coyote and her husband, Scuff, streamed on the PFN podcast, which was hosted by Shiokami and co-hosted by Brony Inspector. The stream was, to my understanding, done unlisted, with the VOD being made public on the 27th. I want to point this out as the original airing was not live, despite the label stating it was a stream, which was done to make sure the anonymity of any victims could be respected and not accidentally revealed live in front of Shi's audience. If I am incorrect on that point, I am open to correction. The goal of this stream was for Lucky to give her side of events, and after sitting down and listening to it, it left me observing a few more red flags than I suspect she intended when she gave her defense. Roughly 45 minutes into the stream, they reached the point where they discussed the testimony of Anonymous Fox. The clip I'll be playing you is about 5 minutes long, but I assure you it is necessary to play these answers fully and completely in order for you to see every statement in its full context. So please, bear with me. As they go, she even told me once, your age really bothers me, but you're mature for your age. She stopped me from going to the big party and encouraged me to stay at her place to test my limits even though I was underage. She called herself the Regina George of the furry fandom. Um, I'm not finished. I'm just gonna skip this big highlighted chunk because it's a whole fucking mm -hmm. paragraph. Um, mm -hmm. Later that night, she told me she was going to show me how to masturbate. Before I knew it, her hand was down my pants. I was very tense. I didn't really know how to feel about it. I was certainly uncomfortable. She must have seen how uncomfortable I was because she pulled away and yelled at me saying I wasn't going to continue without consent. Uh, I didn't want her to feel bad or to make her mad, so I said it was fine even though I was uncomfortable. Do you have anything to add? Uh, this story is dissected into like over an amount of time that sure. doesn't make sense um she's describing different nights if that makes sense and well, i think it makes a lot of sense yeah yeah, she it's, just different different nights. Parts yeah it's, it's different nights um so the way it makes it sound is like it's all one big crazy scandal yeah um, one big event so so it was not like that um but to address uh, the underage drinking, um, yes, uh, she was 20 and I, uh, I allowed her to drink at my home in a safe environment. With, there were three of us, uh, there was someone who was older than me with us as well, but it was in my home and it was really poor judgment on my part, and I have not had anyone in my home drinking under the age of 21 since. Right, because I don't know what it's, it's like in there. 
Yeah. I don't know what it's like in Arizona, but here where I'm from, uh, a, 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 a legal, legal adult, 18 or older, can drink as long as they have their guardian's permission to do so. So I'm not sure what that, that means for them. I don't know what them. the law is over there, yeah. yeah. It's not like we were throwing it keggers is. or something. I, I was... <laughs> I want to say this, this was seven years ago. Right. This was- HOLD IT! Now, I won't be delving into the topic of potential sexual abuse, as that's not something that I find myself comfortable trying to deconstruct. I was not there, and I'm not somebody who should be commenting on that. However, I will be commenting on the fact that Lucky admits to allowing a person under the age of 21 to drink within their home. The first thing I want to point out is that regardless if the 20-year-old, who the Google Doc listed as being 19 at the time, so I'm not sure why Lucky states they were 20, hosted parties on their own. Regardless if they've gone drinking with other friends, regardless if they would have done it someplace else that was quote-unquote less safe if they hadn't done it there, it was unlawful for you, somebody who is not their parent, not their guardian, and not their spouse, to allow them to drink in your home. What you did hear, Lucky, was reckless, stupid, and illegal. I'll grant you that the statute of limitations is more than likely long past on this event, so you're probably not facing any legal repercussions on this. But that doesn't change that what you admitted to at the time you did it was in fact a crime. Don't downplay the severity of that by trying to justify your decision with this revisionist horseshit. If that 20-year-old had gotten behind the wheel, or if they'd been harmed on their way home due to impaired decision-making, you would have been solely responsible for whatever happened to them. Don't get that twisted. This admission here is going to be important as we continue into the next point, because it shows us Lucky has, at least once, committed an illegal act that is both negligent and harmful to the welfare of others. Now let me show you the next clip we'll be commenting on. She said that I crushed a rabbit mm -hmm. to death like with my bare hands and then it struggled for its life and that is definitely not what happened that's a really detailed account for somebody that wasn't there it's definitely not because what happened. how they had uh played it was that you had gone to see them and they saw the the scratches and bites from the rabbit on your arm and they're like what happened oh i had to kill this rabbit is how they phrase no, it. Nothing like that ever happened. So I will tell you that when you own a few rabbits, you have to pick them up and put them in the cages. They don't of course. like being picked up. Yeah, so and you also worked at a I also worked... raptor rehabilitation <laughs> place where you handle Yes, I, ha I handled lots of birds of prey for medical checkups. I was very handsy with animals. So I did have a lot of scratches on my arms and bruises. I would say like the first half of our relationship was you covered in scratches. Yeah, so right. it's, it's kind of, um, that's kind of like, back then that's was normal for me. And for sure. this testimony of my rabbit period, I literally, I got rabbits and I bred them and I was getting them from farms for like $5. These were meat rabbits. Right. And one of them I got out of a bad situation. A lot of them I got out of bad situations. I was kind of going on a, a tangent with buying these rabbits, right? And so For sure. one, it its condition slipped so fast that I didn't know that it had bloat. And it was like a last minute thing. And when I saw the condition of this animal one morning, it was a, this animal needs to be euthanized and i mean i'll talk about it i know it's it's hard for you to talk about but like i was, again, was the only other person here for hanging on the rabbit stuff or whatever and uh definitely literally one day their conditions one of the and rabbits so was quickly. basically on its last life like the rabbit couldn't stand it. right it was very sad yeah, yeah i've heard that yeah not not good. Good. um it, it it really snuck up and it was it was really sad to see and um I used a technique uh, to kill the rabbit instantaneously. I did not crush it to death, right. but I did use a technique. Uh, you dispatched it. The, the and I disclosed the technique or yeah. the cervical dislocation. It's super effective. And at the time, I was very much um intending to possibly you know farm my rabbits you know and i was selling them and 
We kind of sounded like you were on sort of a, a novice level almost. Very yeah. much so. Oh my gosh. And the, having doing this changed everything for me and the no weight of rabbit. it all. Yeah. And I, I really sold all my rabbits and, you know, I did lose an animal to a hawk. That yeah. is true. That happened. Okay. So I had to be well, more careful. We don't know. Well, not, a it rabbit was at night. disappeared yeah. and made a sound. Yeah, most so, likely. Uh, it, odds of probability it was a bird. Yes. So I, I definitely, every it was like every step of the way I learned something new. And then, so within a year, I had sold all my rabbits and I didn't do that anymore. Right. So. Process through experience. You know, you kind of realize, oh, I had to deal with that shit. I don't want to do that again. Fuck that. Yeah, there was. There Everything was... would come up, like something would come up and you keep learning more. You're like, wow, uh, a, a female rabbit can get pregnant just through the bars of the cage. Yes. Like, no one told me, like, they say it and you think that you're so smart, but they find ways. Like, you will keep them completely separated. Let's and do it right. I lost It's like an airborne pathogen. You just breathe I... and they're pregnant. Hold it! Now this segment is going to contain the meat of this video, as it's probably the most crucial detail that I've observed to have come out of this interview. And believe me, thanks to Scuff, there weren't many, but we'll get to that. Lucky states several pieces of key information in this segment that paint a far more sinister picture of her than one might expect at a glance. At a first look, this would appear to be a simple explanation of events that make her seem less malicious than somebody who crushed a rabbit. But I'd argue that not only does she look equally as vile with her presented arguments, but possibly even worse when the context she's given is applied. Lucky states that the rabbits were mostly rescues from bad situations. There are a few things we can infer from this, the first being that all of these rabbits had reached maturity, the second being that none of them were bred to be livestock. Lucky also specifically uses the term euthanized when she refers to how she dispatched the animal, and aside from that, she specifies the method used was cervical dislocation. Moreover, Lucky also clarifies that she was very much a novice when it came to breeding livestock. All of these pieces of information were voluntarily given by Lucky in her own words and her own defense, so I have no issues treating these sentiments as absolute fact for this commentary. So, with these facts established, I'll explain why this is an issue, and I'll be linking the resources for my arguments in the description below. Let's start off by examining her statement of euthanizing the rabbit. In the state of Arizona, euthanasia is only permissible when performed by a licensed veterinarian, as shown in the article on screen. It's safe to say Lucky is not a vet, and unless proper credentials can be given to disprove this claim, I'll stand by the assertion that Lucky is not licensed as one, given how easily it can be disproven if she possesses those credentials. If she happens to disprove that assertion, I will retract it and apologize. Now, an astute observer might argue, well, she was raised on a farm, so she'd know how to dispatch an animal if it were gravely injured, to which I'd respond by saying, Lucky herself has freely admitted to being a novice at breeding rabbits on this scale. If Lucky was not able to care for the rabbits effectively, it's not much of a reach to argue that she'd be ill-equipped to put them down properly as well. Now let's examine the method used, cervical dislocation. Many who work on farms or care for livestock attest that cervical dislocation is a painless method to dispatch animals. However, the AVMA Guidelines for Euthanasia of Animals 2013 edition argues, and I quote, Cervical dislocation has been used for many years for euthanasia and, when performed by well-trained individuals on appropriate animals, appears to be humane. However, there are few scientific studies available to confirm this observation. The guidelines further expound on the subject by stating, Manual cervical dislocation is acceptable with conditions for euthanasia of small birds, poultry, mice, rats weighing less than 200 grams, and rabbits when performed by individuals with a demonstrated high degree of technical proficiency. In addition to, those responsible for the use of this method must ensure that personnel performing cervical dislocation have been properly trained and consistently apply it humanely and effectively. In addition to the previous argument points, I discovered an article from the House Rabbit Society entitled How Whole Foods Bunnies Are Killed, which expounds on cervical dislocation by stating, according to the American Veterinary Medical Association's guidelines for euthanasia 
of Animals 2013, cervical dislocation is only a humane method of euthanasia, or stunning, for rabbits who are less than 2.2 pounds, because in larger animals, the muscles are much thicker, making proper cervical dislocation difficult to do correctly. When we recall that these bunnies were rescues, and most rabbits exceed 2.2 pounds when reaching maturity, it completes the entire picture. Lucky was a self-professed novice in breeding rabbits, and the bunnies she cared for were all rescues, not juveniles. She had no credentials to euthanize animals, and as a novice without proper training to do that, she was certainly not somebody who would have had people trained in cervical dislocation available to oversee her training to use the method effectively. The fact she elected to utilize a method that has little scientific backing to support its quick and painless nature without proper training or certification to use it changes the situation from farmer dispatching a terminally ill animal to irresponsible pet owner killing their animal in what can only be described as a purely barbaric method. Now, I would love to tell you more about Lucky based off this interview, but there was little new information coming out, which is thanks to the controlling presence of her husband, Scuff. The next statement uh, is Raven Fox's statement, and I just kind of yeah made made a little made a little stip, uh, snippets. Uh, we got you know sexual related topics. We have the, a brief mention of the zoo allegations. Hey, if they bring it up, you can talk about it. Yeah, if, if y'all bring it up. I no, can. I mean if it's in the doc. Oh, okay, yeah, yeah. okay. Uh, and then and then another cheating allegation from Raven Fox as well. So I'll go ahead and <clears throat> read my snippets here. As it goes, Scuff also gave me the playbook on how to be Lucky's friend. Uh, one day, oh, that's, sorry, <clears throat> business-related uh, fursuit drama, I don't care. Um, it, was, it wasn't an unknown topic for Lucky to bring up uh, as she loves to talk about her sex life, among other things. She was desensitizing the topic to me since I was still a minor. She, uh, she then brought up Zophilia, saying her true virginity was lost to uh, her family's German shepherd. And Lucky, Lucky also said I was trying to sleep with her husband and helped spread the narrative that I was a slut. So this is just so a combination of three this is stories. So basically, this is an absolutely not to everything. Um, this person, I, it's insane that she would out herself like this. Um, at the time, she was talking about her sexual times with me a lot um i just to invited... you not with you yeah, not, not with, with you me. yeah no no careful on your wording there yeah, <laughs> sorry, yeah. Sorry, oh. sorry sorry i okay so i didn't know this girl very well and i her friend would drop us off or drop her off at my place and immediately something started to change between her and the friend that would drop her off and then she started hooking up with the mutual friend look I, I, think, I think I'm gonna and cut you off no, 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 I think it's sorry I, I, I told you to talk but, about what's in here but I'm, she says no, no, that on, I was on. grooming her hold on hold on hold on I'm just gonna I'm gonna end this right now okay right. this person was not in any of our lives for very long no. they came in acted inappropriate and yes. we kicked them out I the like, end there's no there's no discussion like there at all right she was uh, inappropriate with the one mutual friend we had giving her just a leave it at that it's like it's grooming it is when you are trying to like manipulate somebody into doing something later inappropriate right. or benefit she no this was this on. was uh somebody that was a friend of a friend that started hanging out with us things got weird and we said goodbye yeah the end you can't be over here you're 12 years ago. Making crazy. Okay. HOLD IT! There were multiple points like this in the interview, although, admittedly, this one is one of the more profoundly antagonistic ones that he had. Moments of Scuff controlling the conversation, shutting it down, steering away from questions that he didn't like. I mean, I think we can agree that evasive is an understatement in this interview. Call this a hunch. I can't prove it, after all. But I think it's worth noting. If Lucky is guilty of the things in this Google Doc, if the horrific things she's accused of are accurate, the behavior Scuff is demonstrating here has me convinced there's no way he didn't know about it happening. Or worse, was complicit in all of it. It's rare you see innocent people working this hard to control the narrative. But like I said, this is just a hunch. Call it a game theory if you want. 
to some food for thought. Now, like I told you all at the start, I don't plan on delving into the Google Doc itself, but I am linking it below, like I told you. The people who worked to compile the testimonies in there, as well as those who came forward with their stories, deserve to have their story told their way, and I'll be respecting that by only sticking to the information presented in this interview and posting their Google Doc in the description for those who may not know their side of events yet. As for me, I can't say for sure how much of the doc is 100% accurate, but what I can say with certainty is I do not believe Lucky to be an innocent victim of cancel culture. Her recounting of events includes a confession of illegal and immoral actions, reckless and negligent behavior, and an inability to be honest and direct with the community when given the opportunity. After watching this interview, Lucky and Scuff have convinced me that they aren't people I would ever want to associate with, and I can't really blame anybody who'd come to a similar conclusion after watching the interview I did. That's all for today's commentary, I'll be linking the Google Doc below along with the resources I used for this video. I want to give a big thank you to my patrons, as well as the artist who drew my character stills, Yune the Liger. I really love these, and they did an amazing job. I'd also like to give a big thank you to Samote, and I'm very sorry if I butchered your name, um, for creating the wonderful thumbnail for this video. Seriously, it came out wonderfully, it looks amazing, and definitely show him some support, because he did this for free out of the kindness of his heart. Um, I'll link both artists below. My social media, Patreon, and Discord server are also linked below, and I'll catch you guys later.